Okay, so uh, of course the, uh, the, the, the title is the obvious joke about it, which you know, is the tech ready for government, is the government ready for tech? And um, I've been involved in, uh, via the Chile Institute, talking to a lot of different government departments, because we're funded by the UK government, and so we, we have strategic programs that work with government uh, departments, particularly uh, in security, um, is one big area. Health is another obvious one for you know, machine learning and AI, obviously incredibly potentially beneficial. In fact, we're already seeing good results in those, those areas. And then other interesting government departments, in fact, the Ministry of Justice has finally decided it should be involved in figuring out how to improve what it does with data. In the same way, you could look at the data about prescriptions and figure out if GPs are prescribing patented drugs, when it could be saving a lot more money by using patents expired. In the same way, you know, judges might be sentencing people inappropriately. Uh, and if we had the data, you could mine that and actually kind of compare, you know, judges' uh, fairness, for example. It would be a super interesting thing. People talk about fairness and algorithms, but you know, maybe we should look at algorithms to judge judges fairness. Flip it around. Um, um, we could go to that discussion. So yeah, so this is what I just said about you know technology readiness and techno optimism. Uh, techno optimism comes, you know, this this is data and policy, and the data side of it comes from, from many decades of computer scientists putting data on uh, computers and doing things with it. Uh, and computer scientists, I'm afraid, are hopelessly optimistic about what the technology could do for people a lot of the time. Very occasionally they get it right. There are occasional success stories that are super fast. Uh, and one, one government department in the UK actually did a very nice job, and I think the uh, Department of Transport should be congratulated on several things. We heard in the last session about things you could do with travel and fairness and so on, super interesting. Um, and Department of Transport, one of the things they did is open access a huge amount of the data that monitors things going on, how late is your train, uh, what, what, is, what is the traffic load across the road system, so you can figure out if you're shipping things with you know, the trucks, uh, or you're deciding where to live to do commute, you've got a bunch of data to make those decisions based on. But they did an even more cool, very high tech thing, which is in the UK, I don't know how many people here are aware of this, they not from the UK, uh, but you don't have a, a driving license or a tax disc for your car, and your, your, your car is tested every year for roadworthiness and for emissions, that test is nowhere on paper anymore. It's completely digital. The DVLA is a cloud-based service, and all of that stuff is virtual. And it saved a huge amount of money. It also has led to the capability to detect certain bad things, like uh, organized crime, stealing and shipping large numbers of cars. You can sort of tell this because the pattern of registering cars suddenly goes a bit funny. So there are all kinds of interesting things where government's got some success stories. When you look at that though, you have to kind of think how long how long that, that took for a government at the, the GDS companies to serve people who are very smart to decide to do a cloud-based thing for DVLA, which is a very focused thing, right? Very, very specific driver of vehicle licensing um, uh, is you know, very, very narrow and should be, should be fairly straightforward. But you know, that's about 15 years after the cloud was invented. So just again, just to give you these time frames, you know, there's a piece of tech, you think it's super good and you should be using it right away because you've heard it could be used for this, that, and the other. It, you know, we'll make excuses for, uh, this is actually Tom Waits, the line, uh, make excuses for unwanted lipstick on the collar. Uh, anyway, sorry. <laughs> that's one of his jokes about tech, which I think I like. Um, okay, so, you know, this, and this is just some numbers about timelines where you've got, uh, yeah, the internet, some people date it from 1976, but actually IP version 4 will turn on actually 1980. Um, so we're in 2019, came for 2020, and we still have about 4% of the UK population that have no net access to sleep on. Um, we took you earlier about the dismal failure of a large telco in this country to deploy rural access in a decent way. In the Western Highlands are in Scotland, the west of England, you know, rural areas is pretty poor. Um, and um, yeah, so so what could you what could you have done with the internet? All kinds of nice things, you know, like reminders for your hospital appointments. Because the fortune if you miss your hospital appointment, every one of those is a well known thing. Do we use that? No, actually, most GPs in school use SMS, use text messaging. Way better. Use the right appropriate technology. And if you if you go back 15 years, there was a very nice book about the use of SMS for a whole bunch of information services in Africa because they had pretty reasonable cell phone coverage in near cities where you might want to know what the price of uh, paprika was or whatever, you know, what, what, what's the price of uh, 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 fruit over here, so you know to take to that market rather than another one, and, and you know, the whole pile of, of techniques that were developed on top of SMS, you know, text messages, and what's great, so, you know, appropriate choice of technology. Finally, we have starting to see the NHS app, and you know, Babylon Systems provides this cool triage app if you ever use this, and 
if you uh, use the NHS, you can go on the phone and give some symptoms and go through an interaction system and then you decide whether you need to be conferenced in with an emergency GP or go to A&E right now or get an ambulance and so on. Pretty neat. Um, that's a pretty cool AI. Um, it's got flaws. Uh, it's not fully tested, it's really fully debugged. And the, uh, the tests they did do, where they compared it against the efficiency of doctors, they have not fully open access all the data for that, which is not good. Um, and all kinds of other things you could be thinking about, and people have thought about all of these, you know, as everyone walks around more and more with a smartphone in their pocket, um, you can do all kinds of things with accelerometer the data from that smartphone. There are all these interesting fun and games you could do. Um, and this is all you know, heading for 40 years after the internet's turned off. By the way, 40 years ago, you, there were two cool things you could do on the internet, which, you know, somebody should have realized that you could, they could have done it a bit faster. At least in, um, in Los Angeles, where the University of Southern California had this really cool ISI lab, which looks after internet numbers. Um, and one thing you could do there is you could actually order pizzas on the internet by email and give credit card number and get payment. So that was the thing 40 years ago, but 39 years ago, it was actually feasible. Um, so I, d I don't know why it's taken so long to have you know, electric e-commerce and stuff on the net. It's kind of amazing how, how so it is. The other thing you could do, which is even more amazing, is you could send uh, uh, circuit diagrams to a company in America from anywhere in the world. They had internet email access, and they would then some weeks later ship you back a metal box with PCBs in. That's absolutely amazing, right? <laughs> That's um, interesting in pre-web. Um, so, uh, basically, email was fine, you know? It, like SMS, it was an okay technology. It was also decentralized, which is quite interesting. People forget about it. Yeah, some 20 years after all of that, Elon Musk's first company did success before Tesla, which is a small success at the moment, and SpaceX, which is very big, but not necessarily an economic success yet. Uh, but he actually wrote the code um, at, at PayPal uh, which is why the tech sector kind of thinks he's actually not an idiot completely. Um, and um, uh, he did write the code. He also wrote the fraud detection system, which is super interesting. It's one of the first examples of the use of uh, clever AI technology to do fraud detection. The reason PayPal went on existing uh, was, was other companies tried to do online payment systems, clearing money payments for your pizza or your PCB or whatever. Um, the fraud as the attractiveness of attacking those companies' business, you know, doing cybercrime on them, rose because they were doing more business, there was more things to be gained by stealing credit cards from them and so on, grew faster than their profit. So Musk went off to a back room and spent a year writing this really cool pattern matcher that would just find fraud, and they kept the fraud as a constant fraction, so PayPal actually survived. There's actually a company uh, from UCL that did the same thing. Uh, most people have never heard of Search Space, but they were a neural net company 25 years ago here, and they did exactly the same thing at the same time and built a system that Visa use. So when you try and use your credit card and you're in an unusual place and you're using it in an unusual way and it won't clear, and then you get a phone call saying, we think you need to, you know, just to confirm that you are in one more place in the world right now, or you should have told us earlier, that's because this, this neural net's running on that stuff. So that's an interesting opposite of what I've been saying, that sometimes you find examples of a tech which was deployed, but in a very narrow, very specific way, but actually incredibly successfully. So two uses of deep learning, which, which predate this type cycle of deep learning, right? Which are both the same application area. Um, of course, both areas, there's a huge amount of money involved and a single customer. In PayPal, it's internal. And you know, the, the, the folks here, at, uh, is it Saran Gunisilaki company, uh, have Visa as a customer. Just, it's very, very neat. That's kind of interesting. OK, so, um, so 10 years of the internet, they had all these clunky ways of doing things, like email. And then Bernus Lee came along and said, oh, you can make it all look nice with browsers. <laughs> and, and then you can have uh, servers that talk to browsers. And then we can have all kinds of graphics and all kinds of neat things. And then some other folks came along and said, oh, well, now you've got all these sites that are publishing things in a standard format. We can search them and build indexes. And we've got Google, actually, you had AltaVista. And, and it actually, actually had Yahoo and AltaVista. Um, and, and so then you know, how long does it take for the government to have plausibly usable websites for anything it does? Uh, uh, what's the earliest anyone here did a tax return on the web for the UK government? Uh, maybe about eight, ten years. And the sign-on system is pretty horrible for quite a long time. Anyway, so security is nice. another area. I'm not going to talk about that, but it's uh, another area. And then, and then a thing that Cambridge, where I, I also worked some of the time, was, was sort of implicated in cloud computing, 
Um, and this is, again, I, I gave you an example of the adoption of cloud computing, but we actually did the hypervisor that Amazon used for about the first 10 years of AWS, uh, I think with Zen. We did that over 15 years ago. Um, so DVLA was more than 10 years after there was virtualization for the cloud. Uh, there were other things around. VMware had stuff. There were loads and loads of stuff about computing, you can share compute resources. This, by the way, time-sharing computers, because they were very big and expensive back in the day, was a service you could you could subscribe to in the 1970s. So do big mainframes somewhere. You could buy cycles on it to run stuff like your payroll. So uh, you know, the, so the non-adoption of cloud by some government departments is sort of astounding when there already were things you know, in the 1970s that sort of said, here's an affordable way of getting lots of compute. And if you've got lots of data, which you might want to run things on, like you are HMRC, the, the tax office, whatever, um, you have a lot of data, right? You have all the it, it earnings of everyone. You might want to do lots of processing because you could spot patterns in it. Oh, look, that person has suddenly earned one million pounds this year. Maybe their money laundry or their doggy or their whatever. Maybe you should just go and have a look at their books, right? So why would that not have been a thing in the 70s? Okay, so um, why is it called the cloud? This is interesting. So in, 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 a, in the late 70s, early 80s, when we were drawing pictures of networks, that the main thing you did was you wanted to connect UCL via Rutherford Labs, via a serialized Oslo, via a satellite link to Washington DC. You would draw all this cloud and say, this is, this is the SatNet and the European internet. <laughs> And you draw a cloud because when you go to your funding agency, you need more money. We need to add some places on this cloud. Um, uh, you don't want to bother them with details; it's too confusing. So Simon Crosby is one of the founders of the cloud company in Cambridge that did the Zen hypervisor. Uh, he used the cloud picture, which was we want to sell you computing cycles on the data center. We're not going to tell you all the details of what you know. We have two hundred and fifty thousand cores in the data, a million cores in the data. You don't need to know how many levels of switch you know. It's all irrelevant. Just do a cloud. And you don't have to care what goes on in there. Um, unless, of course, you're a government department that cares about your data not being in the same jurisdiction, for example. <laughs> That's an interesting question. Anyway, so all these things are interesting. So I'm going to talk about three technologies that are, that this is what you alluded to in the intro, um, which are kind of at various points in the hype cycle. Um, the Gartner hype cycle is great because it's the most hyped thing in the world now. <laughs> So you, so you need to put that Gardner hype cycle picture on the hype cycle. I'm not sure I it. I think it's way over the, the, the hump somewhere. Um, but I'm going to talk about the three things because they keep coming up. Um, and they're not necessarily totally relevant to this conference. Uh, in, uh, well, at the middle of it, I suppose. The top and the bottom one may or may not be. Um, I'm going to say things about that, that are kind of the questions you probably want to ask if somebody is, if you're in, in a government department or a business and somebody's trying to sell you one of these, these are questions you might ask them to see uh, are, they, are they sane and honest and whatever. Um, oh, Zeneb actually said, could I say something about sustainability? The UN uh, has this really nice box of lots of nice pictures of sustainability and um, none of these three things are sustainable. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, in, in, in the sense that, well, I'm going to talk about distributed ledger and blockchain in a second, um, but if you use it for cryptocurrency, then it's, it's definitely not sustainable for lots of reasons, but it's not economically sustainable because of risk, because of collusion attacks. Um, uh, certain ways of doing you know, proof of work is not sustainable at all, um, so but there are other non-sustainability uh, things you could say about that. Um, there, are, there are ledger systems also not sustainable for legal reasons in that you record something immutably and then somebody says it's wrong. <laughs> if it's immutable, you do that, right? Right to be forgotten. If you record data about people immutably and then you discover there was a, you know, there was a requirement for it to be forgotten. Imagine you record a crime on a blockchain. You have actually a right for certain crimes to disappear off the record. That's like a, a legal matter that they're not, they're not even allowed to ask for a record that there is no record, the police will just go, we can't tell you because we're not allowed to because it's more than X years ago, right? So, okay, so there's all kinds of reasons why it's a weird technology. Uh, machine learning, and I mentioned this last night at the um, journal launch, but um, machine learning in general is quite sustainable, but AI in deep learning sense is not very sustainable. And if you're interested in a discussion about the details of this, there are lots of people trying to fix that problem, but training a model of uh, an image recognition system that says that's a cat and that's a dog with a million images of cats and a million images of not cats and a million images of dogs and so on. It's incredibly poor. 
It's very lazy and it's incredibly uh, energy intensive. You take this image, which has no model of catness or dogness in it, doesn't say it's a four legged creature which has articulation points here, here, and here, um, and you give zillions of examples because all these different stacks of 2D images of cats are in different poses, and some of them are pink cartoon cats, and some of them are real furry cats, and some of them don't have tails, and so on. Do you know what a human child does? Everyone's got kids will know this. You know, you, you go cat, and they get their acquiring language. They don't only get that's the word for a cat. They go, ah, oh, yes, I see lots of those things. And they have four limbs and a furry tail. Fur is a bit like hair. And I know how things fall because of gravity. I know the cat lands on its feet because it's got this articulation. So one example, because they're all those models, right? And they're super efficient. Even Kluge, human brain, I'm not a neuroscientist, but human brain, Kluge evolution has evolved all these different ways of acquiring kinds of cunning models, which you then fit to stuff super fast. So people that do deep learning on some problems really should be you know, not, told not to. There's a small number of problems with it, but very few. So, but unfortunately, it kind of works. So it's sort of lazy, but it's not sustainable. We're currently using 4% of the electricity of the planet running these deep learning systems in lots of GPUs and lots of data centers. And if everyone out there in every government department, every policymaker in the world suddenly throws all the data from all their smart cities and all their tax record systems for fraud detection and their criminal record systems and so on into those systems to train up models, We'll be, you know, we'll, we'll be off the scale. We we'll, won't we'll, we'll, um, um, uh, we'll have the compute cycles left to run the climate modeling fast enough to tell us we shouldn't have done it. <laughs> right? So, and then the last thing I kind of mentioned is the Internet of Things, which is also, uh, I think, relevant because an awful lot of uh, data comes from IoT systems. Uh, uh, some of them I like and some of them I hate. So, the transport thing I alluded to earlier, and we heard a bit about um, uh, uh, so access to places and so on. Um, Often that comes from monitoring travel, tra yeah, the, 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 the public transport systems and you know, often private systems too. Uh, for example, uh, in the UK, in some countries, you can get paid as you drive insurance. They put a box in your car to see how you're driving, where you drive, when you drive, and then they figure out what the rate should be because you're always super safe and you never speed in or only driving this many hours or whatever. Okay? Um, so that box has records and stuff. But, um, and taxis in lots of places, uh, famously in New York, you can get Yellow Cab and Uber traces and compare the efficiency of these two taxi services. If you're in New York, Yellow Cab is faster than Uber. Um, as soon as anyone thinks it's raining and they need to get in the cab, the Uber search price goes up here. Anyway, so it's just, and you can go look that up. So, so, so that trace data is part of you know, an IoT system, if you like. It's actually driven by GPS in the, in the thing, but it's then logged through telemetry to somewhere for the dispatchers and for whatever. Uh, and for you, if, it's, if, you're, if you're monitoring as well, either a light outside you have a lift or whatever you're using, um, or for the driver to know where you are, as well from the GPS in your phone. Okay, so that's an IoT system, it's kind of vaguely okay, except there's this huge amount of data flying around, which is ephemeral, and it's not completely obvious to me that, you know, that somebody keeps it and loads it, and then you have all these data centers, all these data, the analytics, and comparing all these different business models and so on. And, um, but, if you start doing that with every single widget in the world, every light switch, when you turn the light on and off, sends stuff off to Google Land, so Google can do, anal uh, you know, can do analytics on when you'll need a new light bulb in your house, so it can target and add to you for the best new light bulb you might want. Right? This is not a good plan. The energy use of moving that telemetry data to a data center halfway across the planet and back is terrible, but also, uh, reliability is useless. You know what internet availability looks like when you look at the world. Um, the mean uh, outage for UK households at the last time I looked for broadband access is about four hours a year. So average across the whole UK. I'm, I'm probably out of date, but you know, it's sort of on order that. So imagine you couldn't use a thing in your house because it needed to talk to HQ to do authorization before you could use that thing, because it needs to log how you're using it and so on. It needs to report that it's been wear and tear on the on-off switch and so on, because you might need, might need your on-off switch to replace. Yeah, so four hours a day you can't do a thing. Like, for example, it might be open the front door, because there's somebody there who the face recognition system says is friendly, or is it somebody you know, right? Um, and it's done that by sending a face picture to the face learning system and face palm man. Um, okay, so this is not a, not a good plan. And you think this, you think this is how but why would anyone build a system like that? Well, almost all IoT systems work like that. The coffee machine we have in the Turing Institute is kind of famous. It's an iPad on top of a huge box full of the usual coffee machines, a bean grinder, and milk supply, and water supply, and blah. If the iPad can't see the internet, you can't get coffee. How stupid is that, right? You know, I mean, you can have a hand coffee grinder, you know, you know, or a 
current machine or a million ways of making coffee and somebody's invented a way to make it less reliable. Um, IoT, let me tell you, IoT was obviously going to be a massive fail in many places. How, how many people here get asked by their friends and neighbors to fix their printer, right? The printer is an IoT device. It's a thing with moving parts. That's what IoT is, it's the sort of gadgets, right? And printers, we've had them for decades and decades. And, you know, they go wrong in weird and wonderful ways. They're with paper jams, and you can't figure out where the bits of paper have got unwashed and dislodged and whatever. So if you don't get that right after three decades, what hope is there for coffee machines and so on? But now you make them super bad by actually having them have to go log back, log back into HQ so they can monitor when you're running out, as they do, ink, so they can sell you a super priced ink because they locked you into their ink and so on, and blah, blah, blah. Okay. So let's go through these one at a time. Um, distributed ledger tech uh, is a thing. There are products out there and services. Blockchain is a service, is a thing um, that you can get from cloud providers. Um, so the two popular things that they use for distributed ledger, uh, Ethereum and Hyperledger, for example. Uh, you can get on Azure, you can get AWS, you can get all uh, cloud and so on. Or you can build your own. And in fact, they, those companies' services will incorporate your nodes so you can have your own private kind of blockchain and link it with that. Um, so it's an immutable record of transactions. It sounds like a maybe useful thing, but you know, we used to have immutable records of transactions which were done by databases. So most of the problems you might have if you think blockchain is the answer for a database is, is the answer you want to do. It's fine, you can get dozens of these. And you can get them for free because they're open source ones. They're open source DLCs as well. Um, and, and then people say, oh, the, the nice thing with Ethereum and some of the other blockchain systems is you can write these rules into how the transactions work that trigger things. So they can be like a smart contract thing. So you can carry your contract. So the Bank of England did a study uh, where George Denisis, who was here actually, in uh, computer science, um, designed a thing with um, Sarah Mikadon, I think, an RS coin, which was a, 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 a transaction system that would allow the government to add tax to the chain of transactions. Obviously, in Europe, this would be VAT, value added tax. And it's a super cool idea because it saves you a lot of bookkeeping, because the ledger is a bookkeeping system. It does it for you. So you carry the VAT all the way down the chain of transactions. And the people in the middle don't have to worry about anything. It just happens naturally. That's obviously quite a sensible thing to do. Um, on the other hand, you could have a database. <laughs> and you could just do transactions in the database and update that and just leave, oh, there's tax. Yeah, that's there. Um, so why, why would you use distributed ledger technology? It's part of a kind of uh, neoliberal mindset, which is decentralized is good, because then there's no central control, and so the NSA can't do coercion on this. <coughs> That's all true, assuming you know, security agency might not all be bad. They might want to find out who's doing money laundering through the blockchain, because they're running Silk Road or something. So, um, so it's, not, you know, it's not obvious that that trade-off is the right place. But anyway, what, what, would, what do you ask about why we'd use blockchain, blockchain system? You want something that's decentralized. You, want, uh, you can't find a single point of trust. Your government department, you probably trust, hopefully, you trust the judiciary. For example, that's the why you have a separate judiciary. That's why we have these pillars of government separated in most of the liberal societies. You have to be a bit of a neoliberal nutter to not trust any part of government. And if you are that person, you know, why do you trust anyone else either? You, know, you're, you should be living in that. that Concrete box on the top of a hill in Utah somewhere. Whatever. Um, of course, there are situations. There are use cases for this. I'm oh, sorry. Don't get me wrong. I'm not going to say there are no use cases for this. But the no single point of trust. You know, what's an example is a very long-running business like the um, energy businesses of the world who are digging up, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, oil from here, there, and everywhere. And you want to know you're buying from a green company when they fill the ground in again. They plant 10,000 trees 30, 40, 50, 70 years later. And they've been doing that for a time. So, and, and they may be across multiple countries where you don't have treaties. This is a way of avoiding that, having to have treaties. Or writing some stuff and then treaties evolve to match that. So long-term persistence is the third test. But you know, many, many systems, I mean, I keep hearing people here say, we could do blockchain for the NHS supply chain. And I'm like, yeah, you could. Or you could just do what you're doing at the moment, which is you order stuff and pay for it and have databases. Right? Um, and if they don't deliver the stuff, you don't pay for it, right? It's pretty simple. You stop ordering from them. So it's like, what's the problem? Um, and incentive matching works because of money. You didn't need a separate piece of stuff. So. Okay, here's another, here's a fact. This is a technical question. You should ask somebody selling you a distributed ledger technology. Um, one, 
what transaction rate do you support? How many transactions a second globally on your blockchain can you carry out? So you separate out reads and writes, the writes are the, you know, I'm adding to the end of the blockchain, and reads are I'm checking everything down the blockchain. And compare that number you get back from them with what the, your local bank can do, what the Bank of England could do, what your Visa card could do, what PayPal can do. And you'll get a much, you'll find out that distributed ledgers are a much lower number. So if you're in the business of, I heard the data from the French health system, where they have an insurance-based health system, so nobody pays if they're dying, but you, you essentially all of the transactions with health go through uh, the insurance government, the state funded insurance system. And they were, they were data mining the insurance data to see all, all kinds of interesting things, you know, high dimensional questions about which drugs are effective and so on. Very, very interesting. Um, so, but one of the things it tells you, if you have 60 million people in your health system, and in any given day, you're seeing on the order of a million of them in various hospitals and GP practices and so on. And those people are also getting updates on their prescriptions with a pharmacy. You're doing multiple millions of transactions per day. So can you do that? Just one government department in that size system. Okay. Estonia can do it because their population is one million. So get good, great, lovely tech. Doesn't, if you use a blockchain, I don't think they would use a blockchain for this either. Um, but they might be able to, but it won't scale. Um, and then another question is, what's the latency? Because you might not want to be, you know, imagine you're sort of blockchain sort of checking about paying VAT because you're buying beer for some people and it's a business trip and you're going to claim it. So you actually want to pass that through somehow. And you're sitting there waiting in the bar for five minutes while the, 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 the chain updates, right? Not, not good. Okay, so, and then my last question for many tech today is there's not that much of a good reason in software technologies to not open source your tech. There, there are a few, but, but in this area, there are several open source blockchain systems out there and they're fine. So if you're not open source you, yours, there's a question about what's wrong with it, right? So, okay. Um, so notice, sorry, just when talking about distributed ledger technology, I'm talking about the ledgers, not the cryptocurrency. Nobody really seriously is thinking any more about doing cryptocurrencies for a big system at the moment. There are e-payment systems that are not blockchain based out there, um, but there's some real scale issue. But the big, big thing is the, um, the, the collision risks um, are really, really problematic. Last time I heard an Oxford economic professor had been analyzing the Bank of England's design and said, actually, you can't work out what the risk is. So you're not going to run a currency. You don't know what the risk of a running your currency is. Right? That's just not a thing. Um, but the DLT stuff you know, may be OK. You may get answers to these questions that are, that are OK for your application. OK, machine learning brackets AI. Um, again, don't, don't mix up blockchain um, with cryptocurrency. That's just an application blockchain. And missing out ML and AI is super annoying. In the last three or four years, everyone's put everything back under AI. And some of you may have been around 35 years ago when we had the first winter of AI, when a bunch of very clever people made many promises about what AI would do and sort of failed to deliver. I suspect that what it was was that the customers misunderstood what they were promising. And most of what they were promising was to have neuro neurological models of human brains and intelligence and perception and motion and stuff and build robots. And then 30 years later, we can do a lot of that stuff. Um, but we don't have general AI, which is one of the things they promised. Um, but what we do have is a whole pile of machine learning. But most of what's inside machine learning is incredibly useful to governments. It's statistics. And you know, there are people here from ONS and other you know, national statistics bodies who, who've done this stuff. And, and some of the algorithms, you know, you look at some person, oh, this is AI technique. And you go, do you know, do you know that, that technique uh, for relinking records in the census? It's 1969, that is. I'm not joking, that's actually what I'm proposing to use two years from now in the next national census of the UK. They go around and ask everyone for everything about everyone. And it's nothing wrong with this, it's a, it's, a, it's a pretty good algorithm because you know what, it's been tried a lot and it works. So you ask somebody, you know, what's their name? And they give you a different, slightly different version of the name because they kind of decide to spell it differently or shorten it and their address is slightly different and so on. But how do you match that with the previous one so you can do it there? Yeah, there's a way of doing this, and it's old. It's not a problem, it's just good statistics. Actually, there are better ways to do that, that particular problem, but it works. Why would you mess with it, okay? And, and what, of course, really what happened with uh, machine learning was analytics, um, and there was nothing to do with Cambridge and Cambridge Analytica. There's no connection with that. <laughs> so, but analytics, of course, is why everyone kind of rushed into this thing, which is data centers which had lots of data about you, which could be just your Gmail, it could be just your Facebook, it could be just your tweets or whatever. 
then suddenly realize that, that, that you search, this is a really great space to figure out how you monetize that data by targeting how to do doing market research and doing click through, all those things. So that's a, you know, the greed rush there. But in the process, a lot of the software, much of it open source, has been really kind of uh, made very slick and usable and you know, affordable, open source free. You can just go get large numbers of, of I, I still call machine learning uh, code that just does linear regression or um, you know, some other useful thing. Um, by the way, if, you've, if somebody tries to sell you um, Markov chain, uh, multi color Markov chain system, that's another one. And you people go, this is really good. You can do a probabilistic program with Bayesian model inferences based on MCMC. MCMC, the first implementation of Metropolis Hastings, was done for the Manhattan Project, right, for figuring out when you've got a critical mass of nuclear stuff to build an ABOL. So that makes it 75 years old. So there's a very cool album that's only just come back around again. It's 75 years, more than 75 years old. OK. Um, there's a joke everyone makes. I'm sorry, I keep making bad jokes, but I will just say it again, which is really what's AI is anything you can't explain, right? So, so everything over here, machine learning and statistics is stuff we understand and we know what it's doing. And AI is the bits we don't know how to do. But in general, AI is the bit. How, do you, how would you build it? an artificial thing that appears to do all the things a human does? The Turing test is a relatively narrow, naive model of how you check that you've done that. Um, but that's, um, that's not what we're really saying here. But it's actually a critical point. Um, and I go back to deep learning, which I've already had a rant about. Deep learning systems are neural nets. They have lots of layers. Typically, face recognition neural nets, typically uh, state of the art 150 plus layers. We're kind of starting to have a feel about why you've got all these layers, that some of them are doing edge detection, and ear detection, and hair detection, and glasses detection, and so on. Um, and, um, and they're doing dimensionality reduction and doing a bunch of other steps. But we don't completely know, and we also don't completely understand why they go wrong. And you've probably seen the press on adversarial images, uh, where some folks in Berkeley stuck a few post-its on front of uh, road signs, and then the, the image processing smart cars that were driving themselves around were completely fooled by this. And none of us would be completely fooled by it. Of course, we'd be fooled by something else, so to be fair. fair. But this, is, this is, of course, is not a good plan if you're going to build some self-driving cars that you know, the people who make them are going to accept the liability. Because they won't know quite what went wrong. And um, one of the things that happens in crash investigation is you know, when somebody dies, you go and figure out what went wrong. You kind of know why 737 Maxes fall out of the sky. <laughs> <laughs> and that was, that was a regulatory issue, right? The, the, the aircraft safety regulator basically subcontracted back to the aircraft manufacturer to regulate its own safety. So this is a really stupid idea, obviously. Nothing to do with the stupid AI. Um, okay. But it's an interesting regulatory lesson. But, but, it, but you wouldn't put a system that was safety critical, like a self-driving car, if you didn't understand. But you probably also wouldn't do it if you're trying to do, for example, a crime prediction or modeling. Uh, or sentencing, uh, or anything where you know, it's going to hurt people when you get it wrong. So your false positive rate could be too high, but also not explainable. False positive rate, when it's just your IRC is not brilliant, might be okay because you might have you might understand why what what we have confidence in that, and you say, oh, we're not we're now in the band, we're not confident. But in a neural net, you might not be able to state the confidence. That said, there are people working it, so you know there are, and, and I mean, in not just in academic. But it's just, a, it's just a case of, is this ready for prime time type thing, right? That's the sort of, but all those other old fashioned machine learning stuff that the statisticians have been doing for decades in operations research and stuff are great. Loads of color, it's all good. So not a problem. Um, yeah, so if somebody's peddling you AI, so like the blockchain distributed ledgers, these are sort of my, my current questions I would ask them. Because it's sort of, it, this is, these are sort of questions to, to hear them, they, they could have good answers to this, it would be super cool, right? Um, so it's, are they aware of what the current concerns about a machine learning AI system would be? One of them is, what's your interpretability of your system? So can your system tell us why it's doing this rather than that? Uh, and when I say tell us, they have to have an answer about who us is. So if it's a medical diagnosis system, it may not need to tell the patient. It will tell the doctor who will then use a, another level of a different style of explainability, which is how do you convey things to lay people? who don't know what this survival curve means, right? So, so that's a, but you have to have some answer to that. So if this thing is predicting you're gonna get this thing unless you have this treatment, this treatment has this risk and so on, and you know, there's a range of choices with quality of life expectation, blah, 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 then um, it, 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 it should say all that, I mean, I'm not an expert, but say all that to the doctor and then the doctor can reinterpret that 
that's, that's okay, that would be one story. But in other situations, you might want something as a direct explanation. It might be, you're not, that's happened to my daughter, we are trying to add her to car insurance. She just passed a driving test, age 30, and we, we call up all these insurance companies, they go, no! And we're like, why? And they say, we can't tell you, it's just our policy, you know, we can't do that. And then one of them leaked it, why? And it was like, ah, oh, your car is too powerful. And it's a 21-year-old two-liter Subaru. It's like not powerful. They say, yeah, but it's just in a band that's that powerful band. We can't do anything about that. We can't say it's, you know. Um, and they said, you could either get a less powerful car or you could go to one of these like shady, sketchy companies and they'll all these groceries. And they were actually recommended some people, which was quite interesting, who then didn't. Um, anyway. So, but they, they, they did the interpretation for us, which was really nice. It was really good. You know, they didn't go into the exact model of their, their system. I bet you, by the way, it wasn't deep learning. I guarantee it was just a regression fit thing, right? It was just say age, you know, years since license, number of you know, accident three years, um, yeah, whatever. Very simple, and it's super accurate too, because they got a large, large amount of data. Okay, um, yeah, uh, another one to ask people about their AI is how do you, how do you device your training data? So the very famous case of US sentencing where they used an AI to, to decide whether they would do custodial sentencing people because they might reoffend and keep them out of, off the street for their reoffend. The problem was the input data was biased because the humans that had been making the decision previously were biased because, oh, look, a black person, much more likely to need arresting. And then jury goes, oh, a black person, probably guilty, even though there's not much evidence for it. And then, oh, we better send them to jail because they will cause all the problems in this area. And now your statistics are completely biased. Area. This is a well-known thing, right? So how do you devise the data? Well, actually, it's not trivial. Because you need to go look at the other end of the population, maybe even do A-B testing. You need to send some white people to jail and see what happens, <laughs> maybe. Um, or you could, of course, get an explanatory model. You could actually go and look at, and you might have a natural experiment to observe the data being gathered in different areas at different times when the rules are different, the population distribution is different. You go, oh, yeah, OK, I see these biases creeping here, here, and here. And then you, you would add in an interpretable way how your devising system. So that would be interesting. And then the last one is sort of reproducibility and also robustness. But you know, if you, re you run this in twice, you get the same answer, or at least the same class of answer. So I used to send email to the directors of Microsoft Research, and I was on the advisory board. And the directors, uh, one of the directors at the time was Chris Bishop, who's actually one of the world's leading pattern mapping um, and machine learning guys. And I would get non deterministic spam filtering. So, so Andrew Herbert was the director, Chris Bishop was the deputy director, and one of them would get a message, not the other. And then the next message, the other one would get it, not the other. Because they had basically a stochastic Bayesian learning system for spam filtering. So it did different things each time. And actually, it was pretty weird, because you'd have thought they'd have learned the rule, but they replied to me, and then I replied to them. But anyway, I don't know why it didn't do Microsoft, who knows. But that might be OK in that situation, whereas if it's your arrest of people sensitive people and stuff and you get non-reproducible results, how are you going to compare what this did with someone else's product or humans? Oops, I'm running out of time. OK, the last topic for kind of trashing expectation is um, Internet of Things. Internet of Things are largely siloed things at the moment, so it's not an Internet of Things. This is a misnomer, a complete lie. Most things you get that you put on the Internet just talk to a cloud service. So you get your smart surveillance system for your house, and it talks to the surveillance company, but you can't integrate it with any other thing in your house, right? With the central heating system. So you know, so the, when the windows are open, the alarm goes off. It doesn't turn the heating off, but it'd be nice if it did. So you could heat the, the planet, okay? So these IoT systems are not internet things. They're just siloed sensors talking to services. There are lots of them. They're all being beaten up to put smart meters in a house so that the meter companies, the electricity company, don't have to send a meter reader around to our house. That's the main reason. They claim they want to spy on your electricity use so they can do really cunning pricing schemes, which are known not to work. They don't affect people's behavior. It's being studied. It's a pre of time. So they put in this incredibly expensive system that sends reports of electricity use. All they really needed is a, a monthly report and the bill. That's it. They don't need a report every 15 seconds, whatever. Waste of energy sending that report. Waste of network bandwidth, right? So, broken. Um, and there are massive privacy issues. Why are they not doing data minimization? They're sending all this data which says, so rob me, because they can tell us that they're not in the house. I mean, it's a well-known example. I'm using lots of well-known examples. There are lots of other examples. The real, the real issue for IoT, though, for me, is I mentioned earlier, is you have moving parts, and the moving parts have actuators. And the classic thing here is brakes, and there are being demos of people remotely turning off brakes in cars over Wi-Fi because the security was not well designed. 
Um, so it would be nice if, actually the government has actually started, the UK government has started talking about kind of regulation, more regulation in this space. Um, and we could, if people are interested, I could talk about it. We were talking yesterday about a bunch of things here. Um, but anyway, to get to the last thing about IoT, you know, one of the things to ask your IoT dealer, who's a bit like a drug dealer, um, is, uh, you know, what's your product liability statement? You know, are you accepting liability? What are the published APIs for your systems? I, you know, application programming interfaces. So I can actually IoT it. I can actually connect it to other things on the internet. So I can build things that are usefully combine information about my welfare or my ancient mum's welfare and whether her window is open and her heating is off so she's getting hypothermia. You know, so I can go around and shut the window or whatever. Can I do that? If I can't, I, you know, well, tell me why not. Um, and the last one, this is, this is a recent thing that's, this is coming in. NIST just published a cool report uh, on this, and the UK government is discussing this. Which I don't know other people from lots of countries, so if, if you're, you may be ahead of this, which would be super. What's your software update plans, support plans for your product six to ten years from now? Right? I have a 21 year old car, Subaru, update the engine management system computer software. That's incredible. I mean, amazing. But you, know, you buy a, uh, you know, some surveillance system. Uh, for $15 or whatever, you stick it in, and then three years later, it's not supported anymore, and there's a security problem. The vulnerability is discovered, and your surveillance system is vulnerable. Actually, as far as we can tell, all the internet-based surveillance systems are vulnerable. Um, but what's the software update plan? You know, you buy white goods, but what's the, life, you know, the average lifespan of typical white goods, like a fridge or a washing machine or a dishwasher, which you're now going to put on the internet so they can talk to the smart meter, and they can measure the web, talk to the weather system, predict what clothes you should wear, and so on. You know, but you keep these things for 15 years. They're, they're well made, they're nice, they're sustainable. And then some idiot puts an IoT widget in them and then you're, you're, you're suddenly, a washing machine is vulnerable to kid hackers who just want to you know, make all your clothes go purple one day, right? So, okay, so not good. Um, okay, so, so generic lessons here to government thinking about tech, I'm very nearly done. Um, don't listen to me, me, I'm an academic and I'm hopelessly optimistic. So I will recommend stuff to you massively too early. I went around to people in the 80s saying, you've got to use this internet thing for everything. It's really, really cool. Most of the time, my friends weren't computing people. They just said, what are you talking about? They're just mad. And they were kind of partly right. Um, also, don't always listen to industry, because new tech industry is pushing is often they're actually just trying to keep their venture capitalist friends happy so they can get a new stream of stuff coming in to get to the point when it is actually a viable technology. Sometimes they actually have a real stuff, but you know, be cautious. That's the opposite extreme, you know. So I don't know. I find that often. Don't listen to consultants because <laughs> they're too expensive. Why does the UK government, and I'm sure other governments do this, go to consultants? They charge you the same money. And one time when we were at UCL, we had uh, some people come in and say, "How would you secure a network in a hospital?" And we gave them a 20-page report for free because we knew how to do it. And then some people from a consultancy company, being the A came and asked us, do you know anything about security networks in the hospital? We went, yeah, it's like this. And then the government department went to that consultancy and got charged 50,000 for the report we wrote. I mean, just rebadged and put in glossier font. You know, so. Um, so who do you listen to? Well, obviously, what you need to do is to embed intelligence in your organization. So actually, you have, if you're a government department, hire lots of people that are computer science literate, AI literate, policy literate, which is very difficult, that combination. Uh, and, uh, and then hand in the decisions. So departments in this country that I think do a good job often have the much more um, power in the people that do the job. So health is a good example where doctors make a lot of the critical decisions, nurses as, as well and so on. And that's a very good client because they are domain experts. And, and when we work with them in machine learning and health, we find the ones that are, you know, that are statistics literate and programming literate, and we discover this is pushing out the door, and you can suddenly make huge steps forward, and then everyone wins. And I think that's the last of my slides. Oh yeah, don't ask me about quantum computing. <laughs> but do not get me started on quantum computing. That really, really is, uh, yeah, <laughs> right. Okay, thanks.